Okay, we are officially live. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And thank you to my guest and friend and colleague, Allie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so today we are going to talk about something that is super important, and that is how to navigate uh, dog-powered sports if we have a reactive dog. And believe it or not, dog-powered sports are really great outlets for our reactive dogs, but obviously there's some considerations that we need to take to make sure that everybody is physically and mentally safe. So today is actually going to be part one of a two-part series that we are going to do for you guys. So lots of information. If you guys have questions as we are going along, please feel free to drop those into the comments and we'll make sure that we get those addressed either through our conversation today or through part two. So today I want to first start off by kind of going over what reactivity is so that if you think you might have a reactivity dog that you're running with, you can get a nice visual picture of what it is and how to handle it. So Allie, I'm going to let you start for us today. How uh, do you define reactivity? Well, Chelsea, I went on a journey with uh, my employer, Victoria Stowell Academy, to try and define reactivity for our professional dog trainers. And it was difficult because so many different people have different opinions about what reactivity is. And we all agreed that reactivity is probably not the right word for this behavior. And after looking at many professional definitions from dog trainers, ethologists, and behavior professionals, we decided, this is very technical, the definition is when an organism, when an organism responds to normal stimuli with an abnormal level of intensity, including unwanted behaviors for dogs, such as barking, lunging, snarling, stiffening, et cetera. So these organisms tend to become overstimulated, their arousal levels rise over threshold, which results in the apparent loss of control over their reactions. Is that enough for you? <laughs> I, I love it. I love it because it is important that we address that it's it's an abnormal response or a response that's a little bit over the top. You know, it's like if I am in a coffee shop and someone comes up and says, hey, like, I'm in a hurry, can I cut? A normal response might be, you know, not today, sorry, right? But an abnormal response could be me turning around and swinging bows at them, right? Which is a response, but maybe not the right response based on the stimuli that I was just exposed to. So it, it, it also can look very different for every dog, right? What one dog shows as reactive behavior, oops, we lost our friend. We'll give her just a minute to pop back on. Um, but what one dog um, will show as reactive behavior will look very different than what another dog can show. So we might see ranges in our reactive behavior from our dogs, but it can include things like barking and lunging. It can include, um, you know, snarling, showing teeth, stiffening of bodies. It can be vocal. It can also be quiet. So we will see a big range and hey, th she's back with us. Um, we might see a big range in behavior from the dogs depending on um, each individual dog's response to a trigger and how close we might be to that trigger. So Allie, let's talk about uh, triggers for just a moment. Um, triggers can be very specific. They can also be very broad. So how do we go about um, identifying what triggers our dogs uh, might be having a reaction to? I think that triggers are really important to identify because dogs have different triggers and not their while it seems like they may react to everything in the world, mm -hmm. they are generally reacting to pretty specific things. So identifying what specifically triggers your dog is important. And it's many times as humans, we like to assign labels and all these emotions to our dogs. And it's not mm -hmm. that our dogs aren't having emotions. It's just that we want to have a kind of scientific lens when we look at this. So we want to just think about what is my dog responding to? If your dog is going crazy, you may feel embarrassed, you may feel frustrated, but just take a deep breath and just look around and think, what is it that's causing this reaction? If that thing yeah. is, when my dog stops, what happened? Did What went away? So say, for example, there a bike goes by really fast and um, a man in a hat is walking by. If the bike goes out of sight and the dog stops reacting and the man is still there, then your trigger is probably the bike and not necessarily the man, <laughs> but you can't always address things that easily, but sometimes it's, it's 
the best to look for black and white responses of, is my dog responding to this? Is he not? When it goes away, what happens? Yeah. Yeah. That's great too. And being able to identify that specific thing that might've come into the picture and caused this reaction. And it's also important to note that your dog might have several of these triggers or these, these things that cause an over response. Um, but their response might be different depending on what that trigger is. So your dog could be reactive to other dogs and bikes, but their response might be a little more intense or a little bit bigger to the other dogs over the bike. And we it's still important to make that um, note because that brings us into our next topic, which is thresholds or tolerance, right? So with everything that our dog is reactive to, we have this uh, we call it a threshold, but it's basically the tolerance that your dog has for that specific trigger. So how close can it be? How fast can it be moving? And we want to, when we're doing all of our training, stay under threshold or within the dog's tolerance, which means that the dog is not reacting. And that's not always the easiest thing to do. So when we're out on trails, we need to be really mindful about managing that that threshold. And so Allie, talk to us a little bit about um, some techniques that you utilize when you're on the trail. Well, I think that identifying triggers is, is important just to go back for a second that you, you want to manage your own effort. If you don't mm -hmm. have to, to do use techniques all the time, you can pick these specific trigger triggers. Like I know my dog Klaus is triggered by dogs with pointy ears and tails that are very up because they look very alert. Mm -hmm. He's nervous that they're going to bark at him. So he tends to react to like, like a big black shepherd would kind of be his worst nightmare. So for example, if I come up to a trailhead and I notice that there's a big black shepherd in the parking lot, I'm going to go to the other side of the parking lot because I know that setting Klaus up for success. If I park right next to that big black shepherd and I let Klaus out of the car, what's going to happen? He's yeah. going to lunge and bark at this dog. So by going to the other side, it can be that simple. And the same thing on the trail. If I see a big black shepherd coming, what's interesting about thresholds is you can determine it can literally be a distance. So Klaus is okay if the Big Black Shepherd is across the parking lot, or maybe the Big Black Shepherd is, and I don't want to pick on shepherds, it can also be a, <laughs> a colored husky or something, but <laughs> that, that husky could be maybe 30 yards down the trail. If I pull Klaus off 10 feet off the trail, and carefully not stepping on things, but pulling Klaus off 10 feet off the trail, he won't react. If I pull him one foot off the trail, he will react. So knowing his different threshold of his tolerance of how close these dogs can get to him can really help without having to do anything, any other training. It's just getting that space and knowing his threshold. Yeah. And that's important. Again, you know, it might be something that you're going to have to observe your dog for a while to really identify not only what their triggers are, but what their threshold is for each trigger, you know, and, and while dogs might be a trigger um, for your dog, you know, dogs moving fast or dogs staring and engaging more or dogs that engage and bark, right? Those could all be more stressful for your dog. So that threshold might change. And it's really important for us as um, caregivers to our dogs and as trainers for our dogs that we are very mindful of that threshold so that we can keep our dogs in a place where they are still comfortable because obviously our goal in engaging in this sport is to have fun with our dogs, right? And it's not going to be very much fun for your dog if every time they go out and do this sport, they're getting bombarded with, you know, a rush of negative emotions. So being mindful of those those thresholds and, and even keeping a small journal of what your dog is reacting to, how many times they're reacting, approximate, you know, distance and be as specific as possible because that will help you to start to identify patterns with your own dogs. And moving off the trail, you know, is, is definitely one way that we can kind of manage that situation. Um, when we're looking at our dogs, you know, I generally have kind of a two prong approach. We're going to do our training and we're going to do our management. And I think that's really important to separate the two so that you know exactly what you're going to do in each moment, what would be appropriate and what is going to be best for your dog. So, Ali, you were kind of talking about management a little bit. Why don't you explain to everybody what management is and why it's helpful when we're dealing with reactive dogs? 
Yeah, what we're talking about here is not necessarily middle management. We're not having an HR discussion about our dogs. If you're not familiar with management, it's when we want to manage a situation around a dog. And at Victoria Stillwell Academy, we talk about the three different factors of management, safety, prevention, and enrichment. Mm -hmm. So if you ever use a baby gate in your house or a crate, that's using management. If you use a leash with your dog outside, that's using management. You're managing the situation so that your dog doesn't run away <laughs> if you're using a leash. Or yeah. for example, your dog doesn't jump on people if you use a baby gate. But we also at VSA like to talk about enrichment as a part of management because we don't just want to put our dogs in crates. You know, we could put our dog in a crate and he wouldn't really do anything that quote unquote bad, um, perhaps that's right. working. But when we look at management for reactivity, especially on the trail, we can look at our space. We can also look at kind of redirecting our dog's attention. We things mm -hmm. to block. So when I'm, especially in the parking lot, I use cars a lot to bring a car, a visual barrier in between my dog. Because if mm -hmm. he can't see the dog, he isn't necessarily lunging and barking. We where what we haven't right. discussed for triggers, Chelsea, is noises can also be triggers. Yes. It's not always something physical that they can see that's moving. Noises can absolutely trigger overreactions. Mm -hmm. Many times the jingle of a dog's tags can cause another dog to lunge and bark. So I, mm -hmm. I happen to put my dog's tags in a rubber little container inside their harness just to help out other dogs on the trail. Um, but yeah. you can't do that. Just um, you can make a noise when another dog walks by. <laughs> other <laughs> things that you could do on the trail. I know for our Husky, uh, she has a different issue and it's really with people and she's just gets so excited with people. So I kind of tend to apply the same management with her as I do with Klaus who's lunging and barking. But for her, with people, it it helps to, I play the stick game, especially with Klaus, I become a stick salesman of I'll pull off the side of the trail and pick up the stick <laughs> and it's so silly. And I'll say, oh, Klaus, look at this. And then I'll hide it and say, oh, you can't have it. Oh, do you want it? But this is the best stick. And then I'll give him the stick. And he gets so excited every time that I get yeah. any stick on the ground. Even if they're not super into sticks, I'll pick up you know, anything off the ground that looks, oh, go sniff this. And it helps them focus their attention on something else and get really excited with me and yeah. not lunging and barking at this other dog or person or noise or whatever. Yeah. And that's important because, you know, obviously we're proponents of positive reinforcement training and to build a good relationship with our dog, period, you know, even just beyond the sport in general, we need to be inviting and welcoming for our dogs. And sometimes because we're, we're stressed out or worried or embarrassed about this big response our dog is ha having or going to have, we tense up you know, and then we are responding with stress and we don't sound friendly. And when our dog is already worried about something that's going to be approaching or fixated on something that's going to be approaching, we have to work even harder to be inviting and welcoming for our dog so that they want to disengage from that scary thing and, and turn to us. So practicing an easy game like that of this is the best thing in the world and don't you want this? The dog is like, you know what? I think I do. I think I do want that. Right. And that can really help them disengage so they're not getting flooded with those big emotions. And that management key is is important. You know, again, we want to set our dogs up for success and reduce how many reactions that they are having, right? Because not good for our training plan and super stressful for the dogs. So moving off the trail can be one way. I do tend to find physical barriers whenever possible too, you know, like the cars in the parking lot or, um, you know, big trees or rocks or benches at the park, because even a partial visual block will help tremendously in reducing how arousing or overwhelming that stimulus can be. Um, so I want to come back to that, um, the idea of management once we talk about food, but I want to go to training real quick because the other part of this program for reactive dogs does include a training plan, right? We need to make sure that outside of our runs, we are also doing what we can to change our dog's emotional response to these triggers. So working uh, through a behavior modification training plan program will be really helpful for you guys as you're working on teaching your dogs how to disengage and look away and how rewarding that can be. And Allie, I know that you've done quite a bit of this with your clients and uh, with your own dogs as well. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how some of the methods that you use to get started. 
To get started, I like to start in the house. Um, I know that when we're talking about thresholds, I want to point out that when I'm using that stick, if I use your coffee analogy, can you imagine if you're already upset, you're in the coffee shop again, somebody's about to cut you off, and you go ballistic, and somebody says, hey, look at this stick. You know, like, what? I don't need your stick. They're going to take it and throw it. I don't have time for this. Or even if you handed them $20, they'd still be like, I don't want your money. Yeah. So upset. So with Klaus, when I'm using the stick method, it's before the dog even gets to me. It's before the dog gets to that 10 feet. It's when the dog's at 30 feet, I come away and I, I mm -hmm. kind of have to determine how good of a stick salesman I have to be for how long as it takes that dog to pass. So it's the same thing with our training is that we don't want to start training when we're in the moment. No amount of emotional intelligence talking to that the person that's freaking out in the coffee shop is really going to help them in that moment, mm -hmm. but they may be more accepting of it when they're calmer. So working with our dogs when they're calm, under threshold, in the house, and giving them the skills, kind of mm -hmm. installing those skills, teaching them what they could do is what we're going to do. So I teach my clients to look at that game of can you look at the other dog or the car or the fast moving object and uh, giving them treats for that. So using treats is really the reinforcer to tell them I like what you're doing and it's worth it. We also get the added benefit of having a little counter conditioning in there that treats are yummy, mm -hmm. they're really fun and it feels really great. I picture it as I'm terrified of butterflies, like absolutely terrified of butterflies, true story. And I would be so much happier with butterflies if it was, you know, maybe 50 feet from me and I was looking at an ice cream cone. I'd yeah. be a little more inclined to sit and watch this butterfly. So that's what I think about when I give our dogs treats despite these triggers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that some people too, you know, we, when we think of using positive reinforcement training to help our reactive dogs, we think, well, I'm not seeing behavior I like, right? My dog is pulling, my dog is barking. But again, that's where being proactive instead of reactive ourselves comes in handy. So working on skills at home when it's a quiet and safe and comfortable environment for your dogs, practicing things like attention on cue so that you can get them to disengage, practicing hand targets. I really like to use hand targets to keep dogs engaged in a fun activity while something can pass. And that's something that once your dog knows that hand target, that becomes a game in and of itself. So you don't need food on the trails. Um, and then teaching dogs some form of let's go or follow me so that when you see a trigger coming down the trail, you can ask your dog to move off the trail with you instead of just dragging your dog, right? Because any sort of pressure that we put on the dogs in the moment, including a little bit of leash pressure or line pressure from the back of the harness, that's going to increase their stress level. And that's actually going to make it more likely for them to build those negative associations and even push them over into a reaction. So putting those skills that you might need on cue, working in a quiet, easy environment like your house, and then slowly start building those distractions so that by the time you're on the trail running with your dog, it's easy for your dog to do those skills. I think about um, people often say, oh, treats don't work for my dog. You know, I brought the treats out on the run and he, he didn't pay attention to me at all. And I tend to ask, well, when do they work? When will your dog take treats? And they say, well, when I'm in the kitchen, he, you know, he's always begging and looking for food and he'll sit when I offer him a treat in the kitchen. So great, so let's work there. Let's start in the kitchen and let's get some treats out and start asking for the behaviors that we're looking for. Like you mentioned, Chelsea, attention, the hand target, touch, touching your nose to my hand is a great thing. Mm -hmm. And then start building. They say, well, what's next? So after doing it in the kitchen, then we can practice it maybe in um, a different room in the house and then maybe in the driveway. I love driveways because they don't have grass. It's a cement driveway. So there's nothing to sniff for the dog. So that means that their yeah. is all gonna be on you. You're still outside. So there's that added distraction but it's a little bit easier than doing it in the backyard per se or out in the neighborhood, but building up then to the backyard in the neighborhood and ultimately the trailhead where our dogs are most distracted is the way to build that behavior. Yeah, I like driveways too. Another reason I like them is because oftentimes if you're living in a neighborhood where people are constantly walking by your house, you're going to get some of those triggers that are going to be passing, but you're close enough 
to your house where you can work while they're, you know, at the end of your driveway while they're approaching. And before it becomes overwhelming for your dog, let's go and hustle towards the house and do a big cookie scatter on the ground to help your dog start building those associations. Because we need to find environments training wise where the dog is going to see these triggers or see these things that are causing stress or a big over response, but do it with enough distance that the brain is still working. Because once we get over threshold or over tolerance, that brain's not functioning and they're not going to be able to respond to your attention getter or your hand target, no matter how much you've reinforced it. So using those treats appropriately in training as well as out on the trail. So let's jump to using food on the trail because that's something that I encourage my own clients with reactive dogs to do. Not always the easiest thing, and there's some kind of finesse (laughs) and human mechanics that you'll need to learn, but treats in a vest pocket, um, even treats in a treat bag clipped onto a can across belt or your hip belt can be really helpful. So what are some moments where you're using treats on the trail? I love to use treats when I'm hiking because it kind of makes it easier for me because I'm not having to run and reinforce at the same time. But doing it on Caney hikes where we're at a slightly slower speed, I still like to power walk because our dogs like to naturally walk faster than us, most of our dogs. And so I like to do it when I'm Caney hiking. I also love to war- do it for warm ups when I'm warming up in the parking lot and it kind of sets the example for how we're going to behave today <laughs> on the trail. And I also like to use them at the end. Now, I will say, and Chelsea, I know you know more about this as um, having worked in a vet office, but we do want to be careful with having treats on runs, especially I have a standard poodle, so they're prone to bloat. So I am careful about that. So do you have any tips and tricks? Yeah, so we definitely do want to be mindful, you know, and when before we're going out and engaging in our dog powered sports, we obviously have a minimum of two hours before and after for a big meal because we do want to avoid bloat. Um, the information that's out there is is not conclusive in terms of what does cause it, but I do find that reducing quantity of food helps. Um, Also having a treat that is soft and small. Softer treats are going to be a little easier for your dog to digest and small ensures that you can still pay your dog without having a bunch of calories given on the trail. I do also use my treats when we are doing our canny walks and canny hikes, because that's a great place where you can still be in harness, have that dog thinking about the work, but still safely practice, you know, moving off the trail, disengaging, playing your hand targets. And then it's safe for us to use food in that environment. If I'm using it during a run, I'm definitely keeping my quantity small, Um, you know, using some more of the hand targets. So they have to do a few more of those targets before earning that treat. Um, And you can then also rely on using that management versus training, right? So if I'm going out and I know that my run is going to be a little bit longer, I'm using really small and soft treats that will digest better, but then also increasing the amount of space that I put between my dog and that trigger, knowing that I'm not going to have as high of a rate of reinforcement training wise, but it's definitely a balancing act. (laughs) I don't know if I ever told you this, Chelsea, but I actually worked with a couple clients on getting their dogs to run and harness. We didn't have any other dogs. Their dogs were dog reactive and it just wasn't safe to bring other dogs around at the time, but we used toys to reinforce a lot. So we'd actually throw the ball. Oh, I, I can throw pretty far or we could use a truck and we throw the ball and the dog chases the ball. And right when they get there, they play with the ball. We then sh- kind of shaped that to where the person reinforces right when they get somewhere. And ultimately it was kind of like running agility that you run the whole course and at the end you get to tug. So it's just like in Caney Cross, you run, 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 and then you get to tug when you get back to the car. So that was one way that we could reinforce, not necessarily with food, but also with toys. Yeah, and that's fantastic. You know, not all dogs have natural toy drive. If the dog does, fantastic. Let's use that because that would be a really safe way for you to still reinforce the desired disengage behavior out on the trail. Um, But if your dog isn't toy driven, remember that all behaviors can be trained, right? So even if I have a breed like a Malamute or a Husky that doesn't have a ton of interest in tug, I can work on teaching that skill at home so that I could then be able to take that toy out on the trails and still reinforce it. 
And the other thing to remember too is that reinforcers go beyond just food and toys. Of course, they can get a little more complicated and we have to be very clear with what our reinforcer is, make sure it really is reinforcing for the dog and then how we use it. But a big example I always use when talking about dog powered sports is the ability to go sniff and pee on things. My boy loves to mark on the trail, right? That when we go out on loose leash walks, sniffing and peeing on things are two of his favorite things, right? Now, when we're in harness, we don't necessarily encourage that behavior because we want them working and we want them focused. But if we're moving off the side of the trail to give the dog some space between a trigger and they want to sniff and, and mark on things, that's a great way to reward them for moving off the trail, offering attention, and it can also help uh, be a, a distractor to keep your dog focused on something else more positive while that trigger passes. And we've been working with that with Lizzie, who's a Siberian Husky recently. Her person said, well, she doesn't really sniff very often. I thought that was kind of sad. I was like, okay, well, we can, it's a behavior. So let's teach Lizzie to sniff. Yeah. Some treats on our walks. And I would say, go sniff and toss some treats on the ground or go find it and point out these treats to her. And by doing that every day over a week, now when I say go sniff, she goes to the grass to start to find treats. But now she's just reinforced it, reinforced by herself for actually mm -hmm. She's finding things that she likes to sniff. So now we've started to use that on the trail that we can run, 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 slow down, stop, and then we go sniff, and then we start again. So using that to break up the monotony as well, um, and using that too, that dogs, if your dog is dog reactive or whatever they see on the trail, we can use that as an opportunity by pairing those things together. If you see a dog coming, yes, this is our time to go sniff. How exciting that a dog came along and now we can go sniff. So I like to pair up our cues of just, it's not necessarily something that I say, but that other dog coming brings this great reinforcer of going and sniffing or treats or whatever it's going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important to know that one recipe does not work for all. There are lots of different ways to do this. And you really do have to find what reinforcer is going to work for your dog. And if you're not sure what that is, you know, connecting with a trainer that can help guide you through that process. Um, and then knowing too, that if your dog has low food drive or low toy drive, that can always be changed. Those are behaviors that can be taught to make life on the trails with your dogs a little bit easier. Um, I do find too, you know, you mentioned the other dog becoming an indicator of something good happening. And I like that a lot because I think that that, that predictability can be really powerful for the dog where you have a routine that you always do. And of course, it's got to be a routine that works for your dog, a routine that your dog likes. But if every single time, you know, a dog starts approaching and you can then move off the trail and release your dog to go sniff, sniffing is reinforcing for the dog and will not only reinforce you know, moving away and disengaging from that other dog, but it can also start to turn that dog into something positive, right? Because they get so excited about that game or that activity that you're going to do with them while that stressful thing approaches. Yeah. I've also found that speed can be really reinforcing to some dogs. So if the other dog passes and you sit nicely and watch me, we get to zip off right away after that dog comes. We've done that with Lizzie. Uh, for deer, if we ask her to leave a deer and she points her head forward on the trail rather than at the deer, we get to speed ahead as fast as we can. So that's helpful for a dog at first who wasn't looking for treats on the trail and wasn't um, particularly interested in toys at the moment as we use speed in the early days. Yeah, we do that with ours too, with, with critters and stuff on the trail. If you can disengage and stay focused on the trail, then you get to go run real fast and you know, use all that excited energy towards something positive and they, they really enjoy that too. But again, we want to make sure that we're using that speed to reinforce a desired behavior. It's not, oh, do you see that, that deer? Let's go chase it. It's, do you see the deer? Can you look away? Now we can run really fast. And that distinction is really important so that we're making sure that we're reinforcing the right behavior from our dogs. So let's, I'd like to move on just a little bit. Um, we're going to kind of dive into some specifics on how to handle um, group runs and the race environment and things like that, because I do still think that certain reactive dogs, again, we have to address 
um, each individual case. But I do think that dogs can still be in group runs, can still be with um, in that race environment, depending on, of course, human mechanics, how we're handling the dog, um, the type of emotional response the dog is getting, um, and then, of course, arousal issues afterwards. So even though this reactive behavior can look like aggression, I think it's important for everybody to understand that it's not aggression, but reactive behavior can easily turn into aggressive behavior in the right circumstances. So again, thinking of this big overreaction, too much energy, too many emotions kind of overflowing out of our cup, that stress level is going to be high. And whether that stress level is high from fear or even excitement or frustration, if we allow dogs to sort of bump up into one another, uh, we can definitely see some redirected aggression where um, they, if you're running, you know, two together, they might get into a scuffle themselves. Um, you might be right behind the dog and they might turn around and redirect to you. And they can even redirect to another dog that you see on the trail if they accidentally bump into them. So tips for managing those arousal levels. Um, we talked a little bit already about keeping a really close eye on body language, understanding what your dog's triggers are, knowing what is going to set them off, understanding what their space needs are. Um, what are some other considerations that you make when we're looking at dogs that might be running either connected with other dogs or dogs that are running in groups with friends? Yeah, I think the best thing to do is to start is to try and train by yourself, especially if you have two dogs of running them individually and really working on your cues of leave it uh, mm -hmm. or on by or whatever you're going to use it is going to be key because how could we possibly expect them to do them together when they're not doing them by themselves? Um, that And also, Chelsea, have we discussed trigger stacking? We have not. We haven't really, one, I like to tell this story because I really like your coffee story. I think analogies help us as humans to relate yeah. to dogs. Um, so I think about when, if I'm on, in Atlanta, we have the MARTA bus, so public transportation, and I'm sitting there and I'm already a little hot because it's Atlanta and uh, it smells a little funky on MARTA. So I'm a little uncomfortable. I'm kind of starting to stick to myself. I'm on my way to work and I have a nice outfit on and my hair is already frizzing. And this woman with a baby comes on and he's already crying. And I'm like, seriously. And I'm trying to, you know, do some last minute work on my phone, trying to focus. And all of a sudden the man comes next to me and he spills coffee on himself and on me, on what I was working on. And I'm like, seriously, dude. And then all of a sudden all these people come in and in this big group and they're talking and laughing and they're really loud. And one of them steps on my foot. Now, if I had been headed to, I don't know, the mall pre-COVID, and it was a nice day and I was wearing comfy clothes and it was cool inside Marta and someone stepped on my foot. I'd say, oh, it's, they'd say, I'm sorry. I'd say, oh, it's okay. But when I had all those things and it's sticky and hot and the baby's screaming, I am going to freak out. <laughs> hey, actually, I'm a very passive person, so I will. But you can imagine that that, is that really overreacting or is that really acting appropriately because you have all of these triggers stacking? So that's something to think about when we have our dogs, especially at a race. So you have a dog that, especially during COVID, hasn't seen another dog in weeks, maybe mm -hmm. there's one or two on walks and it's the same ones. Then you go to this new parking place or this new race place. They haven't really been there before or you go all the time, but it's still, it feels different on this day. There's different energy, there's different noise and they get out and there's all these dogs around them all of a sudden and all these people and all these different colors and tents and all sorts of stuff. So we just want to put ourselves in our dog's paws for a second and think about trigger stacking and how many things are stacking one on top of the other. And then we just ask our dogs to go off like it's our personal run on a Thursday night and we're just running on the trail by ourselves and to respond yeah. to the cues like a normal dog. So when we, when we think about that, I think it's important to notice when trigger stacking is happening. Maybe your dog wasn't feeling that great in the first place anyways. So thinking about how can you set your dog up for success that maybe you should just run one that day. If the other's having a really bad day, if they had scuffles inside the house, maybe we don't want to run them together that day. If they're already elevated, just take one at a time. Um, but thinking about how we, maybe you need to pull your dog off the trail further if they're running two at a time rather than just the one 
to let the to let them both calm down before the other dog passes by. But Chelsea, you run with two dogs pretty often. What do you usually do? Yeah, you know, it really depends on each individual situation. And I, I do think it's really important to address trigger stacking as well because that can even happen on our normal neighborhood runs, right? If I go to the park that I always go to, but when we get there, there's construction, right? So my dog's a little sensitive with noises. And then you start running and there's an off-leash dog off in the distance, far enough away to not cause serious issues, but your dogs totally know it's there, right? And then um, you pass another dog that's maybe a little barky lungy themselves on the trail. And then all of a sudden your dogs bump into each other. And even though they can handle all those things on their own individually, when all of them arise together, that stress level just keeps increasing and increasing until eventually your dog is then pushed over the edge. So being mindful again of what the triggers are and doing what you can with training beforehand, keeping space when needed. Um, you know, if we're talking about that group run or race environment, making sure your dog is really comfortable in their crate in the car right? Um, if you if you don't have them in a crate and they're just free inside the car, maybe having some, you know, sun visors on the windows to reduce a little bit of that visibility. You might keep music on in the car to while you're kind of getting things set up to help drown out noises of other dogs barking, right? You're going to keep space, especially in the beginning, giving the dogs time to adjust to the environment. Because anytime you go somewhere new, even if it's a park that you go to regularly to run, they're going to be excited, right? They're coming out of the crates, coming out of the car. They're like, where are we? What are we doing? Right? And so even just excitement levels are higher, which can make our dogs more likely to have a reaction. So definitely making sure that we're addressing all those little pieces kind of coming up to our, our run or our bike ride. Um, and then when you're on the trail, be mindful of how many triggers they've experienced. And if they've done really, really well, but you've already passed three barking dogs, I'd probably be a bit proactive and keep a little more space that next dog that passes, right? Or maybe I was playing the stick game, <laughs> right? Being, being a stick salesman while the first two dogs passed. And then I say, you know what, I'm going to use food for this next repetition because it's going to be harder, right? And just understanding that that next, that next dog, that next bike, whatever that next trigger is that passes, our dog is a little less likely to be as okay as they had been. Yeah, stick salesman is definitely more of an emergency technique. <laughs> yeah. The stick salesman, he's kind of like a sleazy used car guy. That, like, you can <laughs> buy into it once, but you're probably not going to do it again. So I use that with Klaus when I have nothing else. I'm out of treats. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't prepare for this. I was thinking, Chelsea, what you said about when you really like driveways and you use the house as kind of a safe space, as like a home base. And that's what I think of for cars, is what you were mm -hmm. describing in the car a safe space so you can go back to that and kind of remove your dog from those triggers and give them this ah this serene set place to calm down and bring that arousal down because i think it's also important to point out that we're talking about triggers like they're all bad things like it's going to trigger your dog to lunge and bark yes that's true but there are other types of triggers or stimuli that increase your dog's arousal like if your dog sees a squirrel Mm -hmm. Maybe a bad thing for you, but not necessarily a bad thing for them or seeing their best friend. So like if Klaus sees, oh my goodness, like a female standard poodle across the way, he's going to get so excited that there's a pretty lady over there. And so that added with a squirrel, added with uh, his sister biting on him is probably going to cause him to lunge and bark at the next dog that does pass us on the trail. So you're absolutely right of keeping that in mind, of pulling over and thinking about, when, so I used to play basketball, believe it or not, this small blonde woman, but I did. <laughs> and I, I was pretty good. I was scrappy. But I remember sometimes I surprised myself with some of the things I did, how assertive I became when I had all that adrenaline pumping and how pretty aggressive I got. And I don't know, what do you think, Chelsea, when our dogs are participating in sports? I feel like they do, some of them do get a little more, I'm going to put quotes here, assertive. Mm -hmm. They may be a little shorter with, with other dogs or, or triggers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's, I mean, let's look at the sport. The dogs are in harness, pulling, running, it's high excitement, high drive, high arousal. So even the sport itself, we do tend to see dogs that are 
you know, more focused, kind of antsy. It's why, you know, when you stop on the trail and the dog's like, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go, right? And we get the vocalizing and the jumping in place, right? That's excitement. That's drive. And while that's really a powerful tool for our dog-powered sports, it can make it a little more challenging for some reactive dogs or some um, even dogs that are just, again, too excited about things, right? It can decrease their ability to, we'll say, make good choices, right? So it's something that we need to be very mindful of in terms of both that management and that training plan. Um, and, you know, with the cars, I love the idea of being able to create a safe safe place for the dogs in the car. And that's something really easy that you can do um, at home. You know, your car is going to be in your driveway. Very easy for you to work on conditioning that crate to be a positive place. Put going in the crate on cue and make that response really nice and snappy so that if you were to get rushed by other people or other dogs at the trailhead, you could very quickly and easily ask your dog to jump back into the crate kind of as like a, a safe keeping place for them. Um, and making sure that you're doing the work at home Again, just like our attention, our hand targets, um, on teaching those skills so that when you are then in that new environment, it's a little bit easier for them to to mentally handle. Um, because as we know, distractions change everything. <laughs> Working in novel environments makes everything a little bit harder. I was kind of thinking about the cars. Like when I used to go, I, I grew up in Houston, Texas, and we used to go to the beach on weekends. And my mom would always set up our little camp on the beach, right? That had a blanket and she'd bring like juice pops and there'd be shade and everything. So I'd go off and play and have so much fun. But to be able to stay on the beach all day, I needed to rest. I needed to calm down as a kid, have a little snack, reapply my sunscreen. And so I think about, I try and do that for Klaus and Lizzie in the car, is that the car is their place to replenish, to take a breath, to get some cool air or some heat, whatever they need for Klaus, bless his heart. Um, and think about how I can make it their safe zone where they have water and treats and things that they can bring down that arousal so that we get the best performance. I mean, after the end of the day, we're all looking to stay safe, have fun, but also perform well if we're looking for competitions. And we tend to think that our dogs would perform well if they are under threshold, able to listen and respond and have purpose with them yeah. as they run. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and if we're doing like a casual group run with other people, you know, oftentimes you can get some like cookouts or bring your own beverage and kind of hang out around the car. But if you have a reactive dog, your dog might be happier and better suited hanging out in the car while you're doing that. You know, let them get that energy out on the trail and then let them rest and decompress because we don't want to put our dogs in a compromising situation where we might accidentally push them over threshold. Um, and the other thing too, for those group runs, you know, getting, getting there early so that you are not stressed out, um, getting there early so that you have time to take the dog out and let them move around, stretch their legs, get some sniffing in, decompress on their own a little bit will be really, really helpful for them to kind of take the edge off before you then do expect that performance out of them. Um, and you, you might find that your dog is better suited, you know, either at the front of the pack or in the back of the pack. Um, if you are if your dog is really nice and fast and reactive, being out front might be easier for them because the other triggers, you know, the other dogs you're running with could be behind you. You might find that being in the back is easiest because then you can see the rest of the group that you're running with and, and be able to manage your dog appropriately. So just making sure that you know what works for your dog, you know what your dog needs, and then taking that time to kind of do it right. Because the more successful runs you have with your dog, right? The less they're going to worry about these triggers and the better we're going to feel being harnessed to that dog, you know, and, and running with them. I think it's important that you said the more successes we have, the better. And so it's important. I'm looking at some of the comments here and talking about really working, trying to improve their on by. And I mm -hmm. think it's important when we think about, I liked when Chelsea said about keeping a journal. I know it sounds kind of silly sometimes, but it really helps you afterwards think about how, keep some data of how many times did I say on by and how often was it successful? Do you feel like you're yelling it a lot and your dog's not getting it? Like what percentage of the time is your dog doing it versus not doing it? I think we get caught up as humans that we know what the word on by means and we swear that they know what it means. But if your data is showing you your dog only does it 40% of the time, 
it may not be that your dog does know. And what I mean by know or understand is perhaps they can perform an on by when um, it's just you on the trail and it's just one squirrel. But after we've had that trigger stacking, is your dog able to perform an on by when another dog comes by? Maybe your dog doesn't understand that cue in that context. So we really wanna work up to that before we just start using it. Just because our dog can do it in the kitchen doesn't mean that he can do it on the trail. So building up to that is how we're going to work on the on by. And we wanna think about perhaps refraining from using it when it's not working. So if we keep yelling this at our dog, on by, on by, and they're not on buying, <laughs> they've decided that on by means to go to the right or to the left, maybe that's letting us know that we should probably stop naming it that. We should probably stop saying it over and over again. We should save that word and teach it again. Whenever my dog does something that um, some people may say is disobedient or he's not doing it right or he's acting naughty or something, I take it as, I, I reflect on it as an internal data point of, hmm, maybe we should work on that, bud. Um, at VSA, we talk about the four questions of does my dog, um, do I have my dog's attention? Does my dog understand the cue in this context? Um, how do I have a powerful enough reinforcer? And then what should I do next? So by asking yourself these four questions, you can kind of figure out in the moment, why is my dog not responding to me in, in this moment? So I hope that that helps with figuring out your cues. Yeah. And ne next time you and I chat and continue this conversation, I do want to dive a lot deeper into our on-by cue, how we train it, and determining when we are on the trail, when we need to go into management mode and distraction mode, versus when it's realistic and fair to expect a cue response to on by. Because I do find that even when we're talking about loose leash walking, people get very fixated on needing to pass the thing, right? Needing to keep going forward. But depending on where our dog is in their current training plan, that's not always the best option right? That's not always the best thing to do. And, and we will get into that situation where if we keep spouting this word out at our dog, eventually we're going to get no successful cute responses. And we're going to get a dog that just completely ignores us when we talk to them, right? We start to poison that word or turn that word meaningless. And of course, we're spending so much time training our dogs. That's the last thing we want. We don't want our, our cues that we've been building to become nothing, right? But it is a balancing act of trying to find when it's appropriate to use those words um, and, and when we should do something else on the trail. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to wrap us up here. I want to give everybody who is uh, listening or will be following um, along afterwards, I know not everyone could watch live, please continue to drop any questions that you might have into the comments because we will get to them. We will address them um, next time we talk to make sure we get all of your questions answered. Next time we meet, we're going to go over the training plans a little bit more. We're going to go over our race routine and group runs a little bit more, and then talk about our very precious and important on by cue. Um, so make sure that you guys post those questions that you have for us. Um, I do want to take a quick moment too to, to announce that uh, I actually will be launching a positive reinforcement dog powered podcast. So Yes. Yeah, so conversations just like this uh, will continue to happen. We've got a lot of really wonderful people that have agreed uh, to sign on like Allie. Thank you, Allie. Um, and, and have some of these important conversations and get some of this information out there. So stay tuned to that. Um, when we launch it, we will, of course, announce it uh, on this Positive Futures page. So be sure to uh, hit like and follow so that you guys can stay tuned for that. Um, and part two of our conversation, we will have on that podcast. So stay tuned for more announcements on that. Allie, thank you so much for joining us today. And I really look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And that's it. Thanks, guys.